Hello, everybody. Welcome to Outside the Box, the podcast devoted to supporting Central PA's small business. I am your host, Derek Bixler, realtor and digital marketer right here in Central PA. I grew up on the hill, went to Mechanicsburg High School, go Wildcats, went up to Penn College of Technology. I think they were some kind of cats as well, lions or mountain cougars or something, um, uh, and have been here ever since. Had a few sales jobs before I started selling real estate about 15 years ago. If you need to buy or sell a house, please contact me. You can text me, email me, throw a rock through my window, send a carrier pigeon, whatever you need to do. We really need houses and inventory. There is nothing for sale right now. Um, if you are interested in our networking mixer updates, uh, episode announcements, and all of our exclusive special offers, of which we will have one from Crosswater uh, Distillery, Distilled Spirits over here, who is our guest, um, go to supportcentralpa.com to sign up for our emails. If you are on Clubhouse, follow me. I'm at Agent Derek on there. And today, after the episode and every Thursday, one to two, we have a room going Central PA uh, Small Business Connect, where you can talk to other businesses businesses, exchange uh, business, uh, network with each other, uh, exchange stories. I take notes afterwards um, and business does get exchanged there and it's growing. So it's a lot of fun. If you're not familiar with Clubhouse, hit me up. I will get you hip to it. A reminder to ask a questions in the comments. If you have any questions and we don't see it now, we will come back and answer it later. Um, or if you know either of us, me or Vicky, please comment um, and say hello or say where you're commenting from. And a reminder that replays are on YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, and all the places and soon on iTunes and all the audio players and all that stuff as well. Um, and now we will get into it with Vicky Close of Crosswater Distilled Spirits. Hello, Vicky. Thanks for being with us. We could start by just telling us a little bit about your personal background, where you grew up and that kind of stuff. Sure. Hi, Derek. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm Vicki Close. I grew up in Wayne, New Jersey, which is outside of New York City. Um, I went to Wayne Hills High School, graduated way back in 1988, shows my age. Um, and then moved to Pennsylvania to come to college. I attended Junietta College for my undergraduate degree, then moved to the Harrisburg area for work and got my master's at Penn State Harrisburg. Um, I worked in human services for the first 12, 15 years of my life and then decided to stay home and have a family. And during that time, my mom and I opened a medical billing practice that I did until the end of 2015. And then, um, Closed that business down at the end of 2015 and decided to start writing my my uh, business plan to open up the distillery. Gotcha. So you, you grew up near NYC. Did you go to the city a lot? What was the town that you grew up in? What was it like? Was it like one of those, uh, the outskirts towns of New York City? Like I can't think of any right now, but. It was uh, suburbia. It was, I grew up in a little lake community. Um, originally, it was the lake houses for all of the rich people that lived in New York and they'd come out for the summers and spend their summers there. Um, but so that's kind of where I grew up. Um, little Cape Cod house with a matchbox uh, kind of match or a stamp yard. It was teeny tiny. We played in the street, you know, we, <laughs> we were, we were city kids. Um, definitely spent a lot of time going into the city, um, took the buses in. I always had to make sure we got the midnight bus out or else we were stuck in the city. So we grew up running it back and forth all the time, definitely. Do you ever miss it? No. Never <laughs> once? You never no. once missed the midnight bus? No, never missed the bus. We always made sure we were back at Port Authority before midnight. Never huh. missed it. I did it, not left, it left at midnight, before. so your curfew was like 1 or 12.30 or something? It depends whose house we were staying at. <laughs> but yeah, so... When in the older years, my, my curfew was at one. So so you tell all the parents that you're staying at whoever's house dictated that you could be out the longest and then you go yeah. do the thing. <laughs> <laughs> and you have a pass for that or did you have to pay, like drop the tokens in the in the thing or something? No, we had passes because we use the bus system so much. We had passes. Nice. These days you would have an Uber card. I hear that's what all the uh, the higher end kid what the the uppity kids now they don't even want to drive they just want to have an unlimited uber card and then they sit in the back on their phone and wow. even the uber black or they have like luxury ones too um that's so great. that's even a thing yeah <laughs> <laughs> so after college you did human resources and medical billing in medical billing were you self-employed doing that or were you working for someone else my mom and I owned the business, so we were self-employed. Um, and then we had a few people that worked for us. Um, my mom passed in 2010 and left the business to, all to me. Um, I did it for another five years. And basically, I stopped because 
it wasn't fun anymore. Um, I, I'm a people person and working from home drove me bonkers. So I decided that with the changes in healthcare at the time, there were a lot of changes in healthcare with Obamacare coming in and insurance reimbursements changed. Um, so it wasn't as profitable as it was when we first started the business. And um, I had decided that I was going to be done. And four days after I decided that, I called my husband because I was bored. And I said, hey, you know that distillery thing we were talking about? If I do it, will you support me? And he said, yeah, go for it. So I did. Huh. So you were going bonkers doing medical billing. Uh, well, first, is that company still around? Did you sell it? Did you just close it or what happened? I just closed it. And the clients that I had, I, I passed off to other companies. Yeah. Gotcha. So it sounds like you had this distillery idea in your head for a long time, or maybe you're a, how did you get into, how did you get the idea in the first place? So my husband and I, in, I think it was around 2011 or yeah, 2011, 2012, around there, we were down in Virginia doing a wine tour and we were waiting on um, a reservation for dinner and there was a distillery right next door. And so we went over to check it out and I was completely fascinated by the whole process. It's a, a woman owned distillery called Catoctin Creek. And um, I picked her brain for about an hour and a half and we missed our dinner reservation. So <laughs> um, the whole ride home, we joked around, my parents are from Russia. And so I decided I wanted to make vodka um, and we talked about it. And then we, it kind of went back and forth. It was a running topic um, for about three or four years. And we just, joked around about it, but really didn't get serious about it. And then um, in 2015, for my birthday, my husband bought me um, a distilling class. So I went to Chicago for five days and learned about the business of distilling, left that training thinking I could never do it because I didn't have millions of dollars, basically. So oh. <laughs> um, I, I couldn't figure, couldn't wrap my head around how I was going to make it happen. Um, and then when I, I finally decided to start working on it and writing my business plan, um, I was lucky enough that a, a mentor of my husband's um, read my business plan, gave me some feedback, and then came back to me a couple months later and asked me if I wanted some investors. So he brought some investors on board. Um, my husband and I are primary owners, but we do have some investors on board that help with the financial side of things. Um, and within... I started writing my business plan January of 2016, and we opened September 28th of 2018. So it took a little over two years to get the business plan done, find a location, get all the equipment in, get everything purchased and set up. Um, and then we also, we don't only do distilling here, we also have a restaurant. So we opened up both things at one time. That's awesome. That's a lot to open. So it makes sense that it would take you a little bit of a of some time to put that all together, especially with yeah. all the equipment needed for that kind of thing. So you mentioned vodka. Was that the first spirit that you distilled or did you start with, you do a whole bunch now, obviously, but did you start with one and was it vodka? We started with vodka and rum. Those are the two things that we first made. Um, actually, when we opened on the 28th, I was only able to sell vodka and, and I don't, I don't even think I could sell the rum yet because I didn't have my labels done. So they weren't back from the printer yet. Um, so I was able to sell vodka and then I was able to serve the rum, but I wasn't able to actually sell it yet in a bottle. And then we expanded after that and we did a spice drum. Um, so we have vodka, we have rum, we have spice drum. Then we did gin and then whiskey. We do a rye whiskey. We do a bourbon um, and we do Crossfire, which is a cinnamon rye whiskey. It's our version of Fireball. It's it's much better though, I think. <laughs> <laughs> back when I, I'll add this, I didn't say it yet. I'm actually nine years sober, but back when I drank, vodka was my jam, and I I <laughs> love the crap out of it. So when it, you start with vodka and rum, those two are kind of like less flavor ones. I get vodka. The whole point kind of is. Correct. The least amount, yeah. they distill it a kajillion times, so there's the least amount of flavor as possible. So did you start with those for a reason or just because you liked them or they're easy to do? Why did you start with those? We started with those because they're white neutral spirits and um, they are, the, I'm not going to say easier to do. They don't take as much time because when you're doing whiskeys, you're doing anything aged, you're putting it in a barrel and it has to sit. So you really can't do anything with it. So we didn't release our first rye. Um, or aged rum until 
mid 2019, I guess it was around the summertime of 2019. And we are now currently on our, I think fourth or fifth batch of rye whiskey. We're on our third batch of aged rum and we're on our third batch of bourbon. In June, we'll be releasing a two year straight bourbon um, that will be, we always sell out. So we're telling people contact us in May if you wanna do a pre-order. Our bourbon sells out within usually two months of taking it out of the barrel. So I don't even say, I don't offer it at the state stores. We do, we do have some of our products at the state stores, but I don't offer any of our aged products um, except for the aged rum because we have enough of that. But the aged dry and the bourbon go too quickly. So we only sell it in house. Oh, that's awesome. So you either have to be on the list and pre-order or you have to come to your place to to taste it. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's great. Yeah. And maybe a, a lot, a little bit to sell elsewhere sometime at some point. But that, I think that's a great thing to have as a premium for coming in there and for, for pre-ordering and being a part of your community. Um, so how much do you make at a time? How big are, we're going to see in a little bit, but could you go through the, maybe the process in general a little bit? How do you make this stuff? Sure. Um, we get Rum is made out of sugar, so we have 50 pound bags of sugar that we use. Um, it goes into a 300 uh, gallon mash tun and we cook it basically. So for, for rum, you dissolve the sugar, you get it up to a certain temperature and then it goes into the fermentation tanks. For vodka or rye or um, bourbon, we're cooking mash, which is um, a mixture of different grains. So. We primarily use for our vodka corn. Um, we just tried a uh, white winter wheat vodka, which we will be um, releasing probably in about three or four weeks. Um, it has a little bit of a different flavor component to it, even though people think vodka is supposed to be completely neutral. Um, because of the grains that you use, there is a little bit of a flavor profile to ours. Um, but anyway, so it goes into the, the fermentation tanks after it gets cooked in the mash tun, it goes into the fermentation tanks. We add yeast. Um, the yeast is what eats the sugars and creates the alcohol. So it eats the sugar up and, and um, turns that into alcohol. The fermentation process takes about five to seven days, depending on, on what it is um, and how well the, the yeast is working. And then um, after that, it gets stripped. So we strip out all of the alcohol off of the mash um, and then after all the alcohol is stripped off, that's called a stripping run. Then it goes into the finishing um, still, and then we separate out the heads, the hearts, and the tails. So the heads of the alcohol are your methanols. They're the things that you do not want to drink. Um, it's what we use for cleaning products here. And then your hearts are what we we sell to the public, the hearts of the, of the alcohol run. Um, those are your ethanols. And then your tails are your fusel oils. Um, there's really not much you can do with tails. Um, a lot of times people leave a little bit of tails in their distillate. So it has kind of a, a flavor compound to it. A lot of moonshines have a little bit of that tail taste to it. We choose not to, we just use the hearts so that we have a clean spirit. Um, and then depending on what proof the hearts come off of the still normally they come off anywhere between 120 to 190 proof depending on what we're making um so we take it off of the off the still if we're making rye or bourbon it goes into a, a new white american oak barrel and it ages if we're doing the vodka or the gin um, or the rum then it gets proof down to 80 using a reverse osmosis water process that we have and then it gets put into bottles. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Then you just put it into yeah. bottles after it's like a <laughs> chemistry. Uh, is that what gravitated you towards it because of the all the 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 work that goes into it, and there's some creativity also, but all the the stuff you have to learn and the the aspects of that, not necessarily the drinking. Partly, yeah. I I just found the whole process the from start to finish interesting. Um, I never really knew anything about distilling until I really started talking to other distillers, doing some research, and there is a lot of chemistry that goes into it. Um, my husband's an engineer, so for him, this was right up his alley. He loves all the process stuff. Um, and when I walk you through the distillery, you'll see all of the equipment in there was him. He's the one that got everything set up. Um, he did the 
a good, good portion of the steam piping and he, he's a hands-on kind of guy. Um, we actually, he came up with the formulas for all of our um, products. So we did some contract distilling with a, a small distillery down in Florida and they did samples for us. So we sent them our, um, basically what grains we wanted to use, what percentages of what grain, what kind of yeast. And then they did small batches for us so that when we, when we did open, we didn't have to start from scratch and do trial and error. So we had all of our formulas already done before we even opened our doors. And that way, as soon as our stills were up and running, we were able to get started immediately and we didn't have a waiting period before we had product. Yeah, again, you you took the time to get everything set up properly so that when you yes. open for business, you could hit the ground running. Um, so where do you uh, source ingredients? Do those come from all over the place? Is there one person that gets you everything? How do you, how and we, where? We have a couple of different farms that we work with. Um, one of our small investors is a farmer that's located in the Tawanda, Pennsylvania area up north in Bradford County. Um, he grows all of our corn and he grows our some of our rye. And then we get... Um, the rest of our rye and our wheat from a farm in Southern York County. And then the sugar comes from um, Georgia. That's the only thing we can't source in PA. So everything else we have sourced here in Pennsylvania. Um, we do have a PA preferred status with the Department of Agriculture because we do source the majority of our components from PA and everything is produced in Pennsylvania. That's awesome. So speak to the uh, the laws around it a little bit. If somebody out there said, I wanted to go make vodka and sell it, can they just do it in their basement? Um, and then, <laughs> and then yeah. also what you guys also sell other things and what's involved in being able to sell other things as well. Right. Yeah. So to make alcohol, um, it's different than beer and wine. Beer and wine, you can do at home. Alcohol, you cannot. You have to have a license um, from the TTB, the federal governing agency. Um, and you also have to have a license from Pennsylvania, from the PLCB. So we first had to apply for a license with the TTB, which is Tobacco and Trade Bureau. Um, and that process, I, I have to say, was relatively easy as long as you dot all your I's and cross all your T's and get them the drawings that they want. They process things pretty quickly. I think we had our federal license in about two months. And then for Pennsylvania, it's a little more difficult, I guess you would say. Um, they require more information. They have to do a site inspection. They um, had to interview all of the owners of the company. So there was a lot more that went into it. And then we also get inspected by the FDA. Um, we have our FDA um, license because we're a production facility and, um, and then our normal health inspections. So we kind of get it from all over the place. Um, the TTB license is free, surprisingly enough. The federal government does not make you pay to get a license to be a distillery, um, but PA does. So our license for PA is $1,800 a month um, to be able to, to keep our license um, going. Um, the PLCB is, is the governing agency over us, basically. Um, that's who we really have to answer to. The TTB, we only answer to if we don't pay our excise taxes. That's all they really care about. <laughs> gotcha. So is there somebody that walked you through this whole process? Was there an attorney that knows the process that specializes in this? And if there are any people that are particularly good in helping people, you can feel free to shout them out. Um, actually, we, we kind of did it ourselves. Um, we, I went on the TTV website and just followed the prompts and kind of filled out all the forms, uploaded all of the, the diagrams. We had to have diagrams of the building and of the bonded space, um, so the distillery area, the portion that we have our tasting room where our bar is. So they had to have drawings of everything, um, and that has to be in bond, which means that it's basically... Um, protected financially um, in case anything would ever happen or anything gets stolen or we have a fire or anything like that. So um, yeah, it sounds like it's fairly straightforward if you just are willing to go through the bureaucracy of it and figuring yeah, it out it, and doing the steps. Yeah, it wasn't very difficult. It was just um, taking the time to make sure that you had all your information correct. And the TTB was really great. If, if you call them or email them, they will walk you through any questions that you may have. They're actually very helpful. Um, Pennsylvania was fairly, fairly good. We got assigned to um, 
to an agent, I guess you would say, that came out and and he works great with us. And if anything was wrong on the application or if they needed more information, he got back to me and we worked really well together, making sure that everything was done correctly. I've heard other people had issues, but I, knock on wood, I guess I just got lucky. Um, things went really well and went smoothly. And I had all my licenses in place within five months. Um, which is you must have done something right. You did it. You followed the directions, probably. The people that don't get fast tracked are the ones that don't. Exactly. You know, you didn't put your name where you were supposed to put your name. Mm -hmm. You didn't give us the right PDF drawing or, or whatever mm -hmm. the case is. Yeah. Exactly. So, exactly. what about? I've been places where they sell. I've been at distilleries, I guess. Maybe I've been somewhere where they sell like a kit to take home and make your own like gallon of whiskey or gallon of vodka or something. Are people allowed to do that, or is it a state by state thing? It might be a state by state thing in, in Pennsylvania where we can sell you like um, white rye in a small barrel and you could take the white rye home and put it in the barrel and age it yourself. Or we can, we had um, aging staves, which are little like aging sticks that you put inside the barrel and it'll quick age whatever spirit you're trying to, to get that smokiness into. Um, but I'm not aware, the only kind of kits we're allowed to sell are like um, a martini kit where I could sell you a bottle of vodka, a jar of olives and two martini glasses. Like, so kind of like a do-it-yourself cocktail kit. Um, but I've never seen anyone selling actual kits to to make a product at home, to make a spirit. Yeah. Because of their and it might have been what you said. I feel like there yeah. was a barrel involved. I'm sure they figured out a way to do it within the laws Ooh. and everything. And you're not just okay. making moonshine, a, moonshine yeah. at your house. Yeah, it's probably a cocktail kit or, a, or an aging kit. Gotcha. That yeah. yeah, that does make sense. Have you seen a surge lately in this kind of, I mean, the whole craft beer and craft everything and local and and – not buying big box, all, there's a, a surge and all that kind of stuff. Have you seen a surge um, in business or or it being more popular? Um, definitely, there's a rise. We've since we have opened um, two and a half years ago. I know of three or four new distilleries that have opened up in the area. So there has been a rise um, in the popularity of craft distilling. Um, the trend itself is still growing. Um, we're probably in the upswing of it, um, because of the pandemic, it's hard to say right now. Things things got really weird for a year. So um, we actually, I was thrilled when the state stores closed. I went from, from hearing that everything was being shut down to thinking I was gonna have to file for bankruptcy to five days later being told the PLCB shut down and I can sell liquor. I was like, yes. So we actually had a boom in business from March until May. And then when the liquor stores opened back up, it, it slowed down again. Um, but from March until May, I, we were running our stills 24 seven. We ran out of product several times and had to ramp up our production so that we could keep demand um, do the supply and demand as much as, as people wanted it. I, I said jokingly during all of it, I was like, well, if we didn't have alcoholics in the world, we are going to after the <laughs> pandemic because <laughs> there was a lot of alcohol being purchased. <laughs> and if they're drinking a lot of it, they're going to want some quality stuff. So they're not <laughs> drinking Smirnoff or some garbage exactly. all the time. Exactly. Yeah, totally. Can you sell everywhere? How does that work? Is it, where can you sell like you do these pre-orders? Do you ship those to people or that's just local people that then come pick it up or how does that work? So we are allowed to ship within the state of Pennsylvania. Um, we're not, we are not allowed with our distillery license. We're not allowed to ship outside of Pennsylvania. So people either have to come here or we will ship it to their house um, as long as they live in PA and someone over the age of 21 is there to receive it because they have to sign for it. Um, you can also, we're in 12 of the somewhat local fine wine and good spirits stores. Um, one in Harrisburg, Mechanicsburg, Lemoyne, Lancaster, two in York. Um, I'm up in State College, um, Bloomsburg. So I kind of hit a couple of the college towns. And then we're also allowed to sell directly to bars and restaurants. So we are uh, featured in some local bars and restaurants also. Do you also go to like other distilleries and like you highlight theirs and they highlight yours or is that something that you don't do some, within the industry? Some people do actually. Um, there's a distillery down in Carlisle um, that 
uses our rum because they don't make they don't make rum. So they buy rum from us and then they use it at to make cocktails at their bar. Um, we don't because we we have such a vast array of products that we've made um, that we necessarily don't have to. If if we're looking to use something that we don't make, like we actually make everything in house. We make all of our bitters in house. We make our own triple sec. We make our own limoncello. Um, any kind of liqueur, we kind of figure out how to do it ourselves so that we don't have to use another product. The other thing that, that we're governed to is that we can only sell Pennsylvania products. So if I need, like, I had to figure out how to make vermouth to make um, Manhattans, how to make sweet vermouth, because I can't go to the liquor store and buy Martini and Rossi sweet vermouth, because um, I don't have a liquor license. I only have a distillery license. So... Um, all the other, all the products that we sell here, if it's a spirit base, it's all ours. If, and then we also sell Pennsylvania beers and wines. Wow. So you rattled off a bunch there and it's even more than I <laughs> thought you were going to, you, can you, do you know how many different liquors you have at any, any given time? Could you rattle them off right now? Oh my gosh. No, I couldn't. Um, because <laughs> So we do natural infusions. So we probably have about 20 different flavors of vodka right now, um, but we do it naturally. We don't use any artificial colors, no artificial flavors, um, preservatives, anything like that. So we, you know, at the end of the day, if there are sliced oranges left, they go in a jar and we pour vodka on top. Um, that's kind of how we do it. And we use fresh herbs. Um, so all the different flavors that we have that we use for our cocktails are all done in house, um, and we do all natural infusions. We do not sell those to the public. Um, it would be a labeling nightmare because because we do everything naturally. Um, we can't put a um, like a freshness guarantee on it um, or a use by date because we're we're not really sure what the shelf life would be on something that had lemon infused into it naturally. Um, to do the chemistry on that would be expensive so to get a lab to be able to to do all of the testing on it and then give a shelf life um expectancies it would just it's out of our realm of of what we can do right now so we offer all of our our flavored versions of things in-house only so if you wanted to ever try something that was flavored you would have to come here and try it yeah and that's a cool a cool reason to go there and you can try whatever and there's just small batch how much is it like a gal like you make like there's five gallons sitting up there and at any given, at any given time, I have a watermelon and we have a lemon and we have a pickle. Are there savory yeah. ones too? I have so many questions. Oh, we have all different flavors. It, it, it goes from fruits to, we did do a pickle vodka. We did a bacon vodka. We have a chocolate vodka, uh, espresso. Um, we have a jalapeno pineapple rum that people absolutely love. Um, so we do both savory and sweet. It's a little bit of everything. We have a peanut, peanut whiskey. Um, where I took dry roasted peanuts and poured them into a jar with whiskey. Um, but how we do it here is we just use mason jars, quart-sized mason jars. So if you come in and you look behind our bar, we have a shelf set up, and you'll see all the different flavors of things that are infusing at, at the time. And then we just transfer them into regular bottles and put them on the line so that we have them on the, on the rack. So what's the most popular? Are there certain ones that you tend to make all the time? Like we always need to make sure we have yeah. some lemon and orange or whatever. We always have the citrus ones. Um, lemon, lime, orange um, go rather quickly. We're getting into orange crush season. So we are going to be selling more than we can imagine. Um, we go through <laughs> a lot of orange vodka during the summer. Um, espresso goes really well, um, usually over the winter months. Jalapeno we sell a lot of because of Bloody Marys on Sundays. Um, so we sell, sell a lot of jalapeno vodka. Um, some of the more odd flavors are ones that don't go as quickly, but most of the time we do an odd flavor is because we're using it in a recipe to make a cocktail. Um, not many people are asking us to pour them a shot of bacon vodka, but it goes really <laughs> well in certain cocktails. So, and mostly in, in Bloody Marys, that's what most people use it for. Um, the chocolate vodka, I wouldn't necessarily drink because we on your own um because we grate bitter chocolate like 100 percent cacao and infuse it that way so the the chocolate flavors in it but it has that bitterness so you have to add some heavy cream some simple syrup to make a chocolate martini um but that's that's basically how we use it here Huh. Have there ever, ever been any flops or ones that somebody that you I'm sure oh, yeah. there have been a lot but ones yeah. that you're like oh god never again yeah. 
Yeah, there are definitely ones that we were like, no, not doing that again. And it goes right down the drain. Um, tried made, making a basil gin. We thought basil would taste good with gin. It does not. Just letting you know. Um, we, <laughs> um, but there, there have been a few. I wouldn't say a lot, um, but there have been a few. We we did a, um, a Starburst vodka. That was interesting. Um, the younger crowd likes it because you can Just make put a, starbursts in the vodka, or you used actual yeah. fruit to make the. No, you put starbursts in the vodka and let it dissolve, and then um, you can make. It's basically little starburst shots that we make for the younger crowd that they like. Um, and then, I'm trying to think of one other one that was a complete flop. Oh, Reese's Pieces. Reese's Pieces do not go well in vodka. We thought we would make a peanut butter vodka. It didn't work well. <laughs> you mentioned peanuts with what? Whiskey or something. That sounds whiskey, better. Yeah, dry roasted peanuts with whiskey is fantastic. Um, and then you make it in a cocktail with um, with certain juices and, and sweeteners, and you get a peanut butter and jelly. It's yummy. That's awesome. <laughs> so do you pair – You have to, we'll, we'll move to the food and talk about the food a little bit. Do you pair these things in your menu like people do with wine, like this drink goes the best with this – sandwich or that kind of thing in the restaurant it's interesting you asked me that it's my distiller just asked me yesterday do you think we should put pairings suggestions on our menu because we don't right now but i i definitely think now that you're the second person in two days that said something to me i have to take it into consideration um we do we our cocktail menu is is extensive so um Taking the time and, and doing that pairing, I think, is a great idea. Now, this week was easy because it, we have a St. Patty's menu this week. So um, we have three different Irish cocktails that we're offering, and they kind of pair well with everything that's on the menu. Um, but normally going forward, I think I'm going to have to do that. Um, and talking about the, the restaurant portion, um, we do have a farm-to-table restaurant, and we have a weekly changing menu. It's a, a smaller menu. We usually have a soup, a salad, um, about four or five appetizer or shared plate type options, um, a burger of the week, a build-your-own burger, and then four entrees, kids' menu, and dessert. So that kind of is, is what our menu looks like. This week's a little different because we did a completely Irish menu. So everything on the, the menu for this week is is around St. Patty's Day. A lot of potatoes or what are you, what's on the menu? Um, we have bangers and mash. We have Guinness beef stew. We have Irish chicken, uh, scotch eggs, um, Guinness cheese sauce with pretzel sticks. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. There are a few. Oh, we have a corned beef sandwich on rye, and we have a Reuben burger this week. Mm, I'm getting hungry right now, and I don't <laughs> eat meat that often. Um, but when I do, it's all those kinds of things you just mentioned, and especially burgers. So I might have to have a burger tomorrow when I come, right. especially since I know. Where's the beef come from? That's also local. Our beef comes from a Wagyu farm in Newville um, called Eleven Oaks. So all of our our we primarily try to source all of our proteins locally. So our beef comes from there. Um, chicken is the one thing that I have an issue trying to find locally. There aren't a lot of chicken farms that, that sell um, a lot of chicken at one time because we go through a lot of chicken. So that's a little more difficult. Um, but our lamb comes from a farm in Carlisle. Our eggs come from a friend of mine that lives down the road that has free range chickens and I buy six dozen eggs from him a week. Every week he calls me and I go get my eggs. Um, our produce, we're actually um, partnering with a farm this year. This will be the first time we've been able to do this and um, partnering with one individual farm that will be growing a lot of our produce starting in May. So we are working together on a list of the produce that we use the most that we want her to grow for us and she's going to provide us with our produce for the summer. So that's nice. Um, I also work with Lancaster Farm Fresh, um, get some of our produce through them. Um, I work with the aquaponics lab at Cedar Cliff High School. So the kids there grow some of our lettuces, our herbs. Um, it's, a, it's a nice partnership. I'm teaching them about business um, and they're learning how to do marketing, how to do sales, how to do the growing of all of the vegetables that they're growing in the aquaponics lab. Um, and then I, I kind of mentor them, I guess you would say, a little bit in, in how to do business with, with people and how to negotiate pricing and, and that type of thing. So 
we kind of work together. Um, I work with with the I think it's primarily juniors and seniors at C it's Cedar Cliff and Redland, but the aquaponics mm. lab is at Cedar Cliff. That's awesome. I like the more high schools need. Maybe they do have them now. I don't know. Maybe they, they all need programs like that, more business and, and entrepreneurial mm -hmm. programs and teach kids about that kind of stuff, um, especially farming and farm to table and, and that kind of stuff that they could actually use, even if they don't go into business for themselves. Do they have a culinary arts program also that they use the, the stuff they grow themselves also? They don't, unfortunately. I wish they did. Um, but like I said, I primarily buy their produce. And then um, I know some of the teachers and <laughs> administrators also do. But that's it's supporting their own school. So it's it's good for them. Um, but yeah, it's a great program. I wish I actually asked them if they were going to do any type of culinary arts. And they, they've taken culinary arts out of the high schools right now. Um, that's mostly a post-secondary type thing. Unless you go to Votech. I think they're still doing it at Votech. Yeah, it's a shame. That was one of my favorite classes was yeah. uh, foods no class or whatever. And they then anymore. they don't do it anymore. <laughs> that is, it's, it's pretty, yeah. I, all this stuff that they're stripping out. We won't get into that conversation. Who's your <laughs> chef? Should we shout out your chef or are you the chef or your husband? You're the chef. So I am the executive chef. I uh, work with my team. I have three team members in my kitchen. We all kind of work together to develop the menu. Um, we all do prep together every Tuesday. We're all in the kitchen together, getting everything ready for service on Wednesday. And then I have um, Cody as my daytime prep and line cook, and he runs the show during the day. And then I have Sam and Manefa. They're my evening cooks. Um, so they work Wednesday through Saturday, and then Sam and I execute brunch on Sunday. Awesome. That's great. So Sunday, you want to come in. If you want to see you, they should, everybody should come in on Sunday brunch. I am always there Sunday. I am there at 630 in the morning until four o'clock in the afternoon. Let's everybody flood Vicky on Sunday <laughs> with, with everybody. Going to get drinks at brunch. Yeah. You make, yeah. obviously you make yeah, with definitely. your own triple second, all that stuff too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or can you make, can you make champagne? Is that something that people make? No. So no, that's a wine base. Um, so Sparkling wine is not something that we do. I I do purchase sparkling wine from Armstrong Winery up in um, Perry County, Dauphin County, Perry County, uh, Halifax area. <laughs> yeah, somewhere on the other side of Halifax. Um, and then I also purchase wine from Walt's Vineyard, which is in Mannheim. So those are the two vineyards that I use. Um, then our beer comes, whatever I can get from the beer distributors. Um, I try and get as many local things. So, you know, I have some trogues, I have some rusty rail, I have, um, every now and again, we'll have, uh, evil genius, um, purchased from Wacker and Lancaster. So there are a, a few different area breweries that we use. Yeah. And obviously the bloody Marys are probably good as well at brunch. I would okay. think bloody Marys are excellent. <laughs> and I'm guessing whatever juices and everything are, are good juices and every, all the ingredients in there are going to be awesome. Yeah, Let's make my mouth water a little bit. I could get a virgin bloody Mary. Couldn't I? Wouldn't be the same, yes. but it wouldn't be quite the same, but yes, you could definitely get a virgin one, but probably about the best vegetable juice I could get. <laughs> close. Yeah. Closest. <laughs> <laughs> so my last question before, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. But my last question before we go walk around and check out the place a little bit is, do you do flights? Do you do, if people needed to try something out, if they came in, do you do flights like on the menu or tryouts or, or tastings? Yes, we do. So we have three different versions of flights, I guess you would say. We have um, just a tasting. So if you want to come in and you want to taste a product before actually ordering it and paying for it, we have little communion cups that we can give you just a, a thimble little taste of everything. And then we have a three pour flight and a four pour flight. And we have um, basically flight boards. We took staves from one of the barrels and a friend of ours made flight boards out of it. So you just kind of put your glass into it, but it's a one ounce pour of whatever spirits you want to try and you can choose from our baseline spirits or any of the infusions that we have. Um, you can try any, any flavor that you would like. Awesome. Yeah. For all the, I'd be all about that if I was still drinking, <laughs> I quit drinking. Uh, what happened? Flavor. You still there? I'm still here. I lost you it for a second. 
There you are. <laughs> I think we're good. Yeah, I loved all that stuff. And then I quit drinking and all of a sudden all that stuff booms. And now there's all these awesome craft beers everywhere and and craft distilleries. But that's all right. I'll come get a, a virgin virgin something from you guys. Yeah, virgin drinks. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, so let's go walk around a little bit and show everybody the, spl- the place. And I'll make you big as we walk around there, a little bit bigger. Uh-oh. Frozen? Can you hear me? Now I can. I think when I unplugged my uh, computer, I kind of lost it for a second. But this, I'm walking through the tasting room right now. So there's the bar area. I don't know if you could see it. Um, there's our nice. bar area. And then, Did somebody specific build this out for you? So our contractor did um, kind of the, the, like the HVAC, the ceiling and that kind of stuff. And then my husband and I and our, our staff actually did the um, finishing work. So all the barn beams that you see in there from a barn that my husband and I tore down in Mansfield about 10 years ago. Um, I'm the one that did all the finishing work on the, on the bar top. Um, so I kind of got a quick learning experience of how you sand wood and seal it um so it was, it was pretty cool it was a fun project to to do um all right so i'm in the distillery now and i'm trying to figure out which way i'm going here so those are barrels back there that we are aging our whiskey and, and rum and stuff in and then if i turn around here you can see our equipment so you see the stills in the background the fermentation tanks how many Another gallons is one of those tanks? 900. 900? It doesn't look like that much. Gallons. Yeah. And then this is our, our finishing still. This is Black Betty. She's the one that makes your liquor. Um, she makes it all yummy. So she's the one that, that does the finishing product, um, comes out of that, that black still that's right behind me. Huh. So how long does it take? So some stuff gets aged so it'll come out of those bear out of those stills and go into barrels go into these barrels yep and, and then, then what percentage of it gets aged and is or what percentage is used right away um if we're doing an age product it goes right in and it, it sits in there we you don't see it for six months to a year sometimes two years if it is like vodka or gin or a white rum then it gets uh bottled right away and usually one one run will get about 300 to 400 gallons so um which translates into a lot of bottles um but we can do like a full skid in one run basically Hmm. and do barrels get better with age like after you do you reuse them after you empty it out do do you throw them away or what we do not reuse them the we we reuse a couple of them we're trying to do a um barrel rested gin we want to see how that's going to turn out. But um, legally, if you're making a whiskey product or a bourbon product, it has to go into a new white American oak barrel. That's the TTB guideline. Um, so we're not allowed to reuse it for anything that is a whiskey or a bourbon. If we want to do an aged rum or we want to you know, play around with different flavors, then we can use used ones. Um, we haven't yet. Um, we just we sold our first round of, of bourbon and whiskey barrels um, to people in the community that wanted to either age something of their own in it. I have somebody that's using one of our bourbon barrels to age beer because they do they make beer at home. Um, I had somebody else that made a kitchen table out of a barrel. So <laughs> just people kind of use it for, for whatever they want to use it for. Yeah, totally. It'd be a great end table or, or even a, yeah, like a, a sofa table or something. Cut mm-hmm. it in half and you have two sofa tables. You'll see in our, in our lounge, um, we did that. So we made, we cut one of the barrels in half and we made a coffee table out of it with a slab of, of, uh, of wood on top that I finished live edge wood. It's pretty cool. So you mentioned, you mentioned white Oak. That's the only kind of wood you can, you, you're allowed to use. Correct. Yeah. Bourbon Would and, you and, use other woods if you were allowed to for different flavors or is it doesn't really matter? You just need some wood barrel. Um, I, I'm going to be completely honest. I don't know the answer to that question. I'm not sure if the type of wood would change the flavor of the spirit or not. 
Um, the char in the barrel definitely affects the flavor. So you can get barrels charred that are um, just like lightly toasted all the way up to a four or five char, which is like burnt. Um, we prefer a two or three char. It gives a nice mellow, well-rounded flavor when the spirit comes out of the barrel. Huh. And that's something. So when you order a barrel, you order them by char level, zero char up to, is it like a one to 10 level or how, what think, is it? Uh, I think the highest is a four or five. I think it's a five. Um, I don't know of any distilleries in this area that are using chars that high. Um, in my opinion, it would just give too much of a smoky flavor to it. Um, like I said, we primarily use twos and threes. All of our bourbons go into threes. Huh. And do you know what they char it with? They just take a torch and go in there real quick or do they, um, is it like a, a campfire wood that actually like smokes it or something? You have to Google it. It's a fascinating process actually. Um, they, it's, they build a fire and then they kind of like put your barrel over the fire for a certain amount of time and it has to be moved in different directions. And it's a pretty, pretty fascinating process. Um, but if you ever have the, the time and you need something to do, Google how, how to char a barrel. It's pretty cool. Huh. It's a cool thing. And you get, that was one source. Is that local too? I would imagine there aren't a ton of people that do that, right? No, there aren't in Pennsylvania. I, there's one Wilson Forest products. We purchased some larger wine barrels from him. They were 60 gallon new white American oak barrels um, that we purchased from him and he's outside of Pittsburgh, but I don't know of any barrel makers in Pennsylvania. We we get our barrels from Adirondack Barrel Company, which is up in New York State. Um, and then we have gotten some from Kentucky. So it's it's difficult to find barrels around here. Okay. Yeah. Well, there it sounds like an opening out there. If somebody in Central PA wants to start firing, what did you say? Burning? Charting. Charring. Charting. 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 Because <laughs> you could just buy the barrels. You don't have to make the barrels yourself, right? They probably don't make them. They buy the barrels and then char them, or do they make the barrels also? They make the barrels also. Okay. Yeah. So beginning to end, barrel makers and mm -hmm. charters. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's a whole process. Gotcha. So is there, before we end it out, we always end it out with a funny question that has nothing to do with your business or anything else. Uh, we just pick it at random. But before we do that, is there anything else you'd like to add about your business or about people coming to visit? Um, I just share with you that we're open for uh, dine-in service, 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. Wednesday through Saturday. And then we're open from 11 to 3 for brunch on Sunday. We're located um, in Lewisbury, Pennsylvania, off of exit 35. Um, right in the industrial park where FedEx is. So if anybody knows where that is, we're, we're close to there. Um, I'd love for you guys to come and join us. If you've signed up for the mixer tomorrow, I will see you tomorrow at three o'clock. Yeah, I'm definitely coming. And I, I'm, I'm mouth is watering for a burger already. So <laughs> the burger that's on the menu all the time. You can always build a burger. You can right now we have the Reuben burger that's on the menu because of the Irish theme. Um, okay. Next week, it'll be back to a build your own burger. So. Okay. The Reuben burger will work. That that sounds even better, actually. <laughs> what is that? Salami or something? What's that mean? It has pastrami, pastrami, um, pastrami uh, sauerkraut, forget what, Swiss cheese, and we make a whiskey, uh, whiskey sauce to go on it. So instead of using like a Thousand Island dressing, we make our own sauce with a whiskey base. Mm, that sounds fantastic. Yeah. And don't worry. That's awesome. You you won't get drunk on it. I have to cook it. So <laughs> <laughs> I should be all right. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So I'm looking forward to that. And if anybody wants any else, anybody else wants to go, I don't think you can tomorrow. We're all booked up, I'm guessing. Um, but you can obviously stop by there anytime. And Sundays at brunch, you can actually see Vicki herself. And so I will pull up our funny questions. There are 81 of these funny questions in this list. So you can pick a number between like one and 80, what, seven uh, or one and 88 or 78. What, pick a number between one and 78 and I'll read three of them starting with the number you pick and then you can pick which question you want to answer. So pick a number between one and 88. Seven. 78. I said 88 again. Okay. Seven. <laughs> Uh, okay. How many chickens would it take to kill an elephant? That was number three. It's three and seven. That's weird. How many, they must want us to answer that one. And it is my favorite question. It's come up before. So how many chickens would it take to kill an elephant? 
what sport would be the funniest to add a mandatory amount of alcohol to, or what is your spirit animal? So how many chickens to kill an elephant? Uh, what would be the funniest sport to add alcohol to? That would be a good one to answer since we're yeah. talking about your business. Uh, or what is your spirit animal? So I think a funny sport to add alcohol to that would make it mandatory. I'd like to see tennis. I don't know why, but I can't imagine being able to chase after that little ball and swing a racket if you're drunk. I just think that would be hysterical. <laughs> There's a lot of accuracy involved in tennis. I, was gonna say, I can't say golf because we definitely drink when we golf. So that, that kind of takes it out. And um, rugby is the same thing. I, I played rugby in, in college and that's all part of the game. So kind of limited to, a, to the sports. I think football would be too dangerous. But I'm thinking tennis would be okay. Yeah. And you're like you said, there's nobody in your immediate vicinity. So if you fall or throw up or something, you're not going to hurt anybody else. So that's a, that's a pretty good one. <laughs> so before we go out, tell everybody audibly where they can find you, your website, say all that stuff. So anybody listening on audio later can uh, hear it. So our website is crosswater.com. Crosswater is spelled C-R-O-S-T-W-A-T-E-R. Phone number is 717-884-8493, or you can email me at info at crosswater.com. We're located at 506 Industrial Drive in Lewisbury, Pennsylvania. We're running a special offer if you listen to this podcast um, and you come in and you mention the episode, we'll give you 20% off your check. That's great. And I'm not going to use the discount tomorrow. I'm going to pay full price because I want to pay full price for this awesome burger I'm going to have. I eat meat about once a month. As you can tell I'm excited. I'm talking about it so much. I eat meat maybe once a month. I don't eat red meat. So I've eaten our burger once because I had to try it when I went out to the farm and he brought the samples. But I'm not a red meat eater. So I, I hear it's delicious and it's one of our top sellers. <laughs> yeah, when I crave, when I when I do cave, it's usually red meat. It's usually a burger or bacon, <laughs> bacon or bacon on the burger. <laughs> I guess tomorrow there will be pastrami on that burger. Pastrami on that, yep. <laughs> awesome. So uh, hit her up. You can uh, stop in there and get twenty percent off. And for those of you heading there tomorrow, uh, you can get something then. If you're interested in a business spotlight package, which consists of the mixer like we're going to have tomorrow, an interview like you're seeing here, and then sometimes we have Greg come out to the place and also walk around the place, maybe try out the place like you saw at the Ninja Warrior uh, place. He tried the warp wall and all that kind of stuff. If you're interested in one of those. Uh, business spotlight packages. You can go to supportcentralpa.com. I know we are booked out till like September for a proper spotlight with all three of the things. But if you want to do an episode with me, feel free to reach out with me. Uh, reach out to me and we can schedule something. If you want access to all our special offers, uh, like was mentioned here, join our email list. It's one email a week. It's me drafting it, not spammy. You can go to Central PA, support centralpa.com to sign up for that. And if you're watching this on LinkedIn, YouTube, Instagram, or somewhere other than Facebook, please head over to Facebook and uh, sign up for our group, Central PA Support Small Business. We have about 11,000 members in there and a good 10,000 or so of them are uh, active every month. So it's not a spammy group that you just go in and post some crap. If you post some crap, it'll just die and get buried in there anyway. Um, but people are getting lots of business out of there. We even have people saying that they can't post anymore because they're getting too much business. It really works for uh, visual businesses, I guess. There's a couple of woodworker guys that get just work like gangbusters in there. Um, but anyway, please join the group and support us. Uh, if you're on Clubhouse, I'm at Agent Derek. We will be there in seven minutes. One o'clock to two o'clock, we'll be on Clubhouse. You can come network with other small businesses. Um, and if you need an invite, hit me up. I'll send you an invite for Clubhouse. I have a few left. And if you need to buy or sell a house, please contact me, text me, email me, throw a rock through my window, send a carrier pigeon, whatever you need to do. We need houses uh, and prices are super, super high right now. Remember to support Central PA's small business like Crosswater and Vicky. And thanks everybody for watching and listening. Say goodbye, Vicky. Goodbye. Thank you. See you everybody. See ya.